Good morning, church. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to open up to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11. We will begin our time in God's Word right around verse 36 this morning. Um, we are in our last Sunday morning in this teaching series that we've entitled Daniel, Control in Chaos. Now, my hope and my heart and my motive and my intention for focusing our time in this book on a Sunday morning with that title, with that theme. Well, let me share it with you. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. We seek to live self-controlled because we know and trust that God is in control. Here is my cannon, my measuring rod, my litmus test for, Lord, have I been faithful to you in the winter spring of 2024 for Sunday mornings? Here it is. Is there anyone who's evidenced just an inkling of more self-control in the last four months? That's it. Is there anyone who's been listening and learning so that they could love, live, and lead more like Jesus, but specifically in the fruit of the Spirit known as self-control. How many of you would say, I could do with a little more self-control? Look at all those liars that didn't raise their hand. No. <laughs> I don't know anybody on stage, seated, or on the other side of a screen that couldn't do with a little more self-control when Ben and Jerry's goes BOGO. You know what I'm saying? That's a problem for me. I need self-control. There are so many realms in which you live. Physical, emotional, relational, mental, financial, spiritual. And I know that many of you train. Like for the position that you're in, it required a certain element of certification most likely, or training, or background, or experience, or apprenticeship dynamic. You don't just show up and start. And I hope that you've leaned into spiritual training. You see, I didn't really awaken to the need of that until 23 years ago. 23 years ago, I realized I know about, but I don't know. That was me 23 years ago. That's me today. Still learning, still growing. And I've learned in 23 years, I guess, that God is very kind. God is very gracious. God is very forgiving. And he's also strong. And he also holds the line for me where I can't. And in his grace, it's this bizarre thing for me. He brought life from death. And I've learned in the last 23 years that that is a spiritual principle, that life follows death. It does. And I am so thankful to have be, been given these last 23 years to, um, to know him and to serve him. Because I knew him and I knew about him. But uh, you get to know the Lord differently, I guess when you're actively serving him. It's a different dynamic. That I may know him. The sufferings and the power of the resurrection, they go hand in hand. And here's my hope. Today, we are going to finish the study of the book of Daniel, one way or another. <laughs> It'll be done. And uh, maybe you're like, I didn't know that was the goal. I didn't know that the goal was that I would learn how to be self-controlled in a world that's filled with chaos. 
I thought I was just supposed to immerse myself in the chaos and begin posting about it. I thought that was my job. I, didn't, I thought I was the internet warrior. I was going to right every wrong online. I thought that was my assignment from God. Well, I don't know about that, maybe. But I know where I'm at. I'm called to live self-controlled because I know the one who's in control. And I trust him. You know what would be great? Is if there was a church <laughs> that cared so much about you that every day they sought to help you get to know this God by being in his book. Because this is the way to get to know him. This is the way. And this is the way. Singing with God's people, fellowshipping with God's people, giving with God's people, serving with God's people, communing with God's people, witnessing baptism with God's people. I'm embarrassed to tell you that it took me a very long time to figure that out. What, what should a church value? It took me so long. But I'm thankful that it's, uh, that it's real. That to be able to serve Jesus in a way where it's real and it really impacts your motivations and your heart and your head and your hands. In the last 23 years of my life, I'm thankful for that opportunity. And today, here's my hope to pick up where we left off on Sunday, verse 36 of chapter 11, to go all the way through to the end of chapter 12. But I don't believe that I will be able to serve you perfectly. I don't think I will be able to do that. I believe there are over, well, my father may have mentioned it last Sunday, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of prophetic elements to Daniel 11 and 12 that you could immerse yourself in for four semesters and still not scratch the surface of all that's here. And in the 32 minutes that I have with you, here's what we'll do. We're going to look at Daniel 11, 36 through 45, and these cover events, conflicts, that will happen in Daniel's 70th seven. You say, look, sir, this is my first Sunday here. What in the world are you talking about? There's people around you that it's not their first Sunday here. So introduce yourself. Get to know them. Maybe they'll help you. You know, the best way to have a friend is to be a friend. The best way to find friends is not to look for friends, but to be a friend. If you go somewhere looking for a friend, you ain't never going to find them. But if you go somewhere looking to be a friend, you'll find friends. Does that make sense? That's how that works. So today, let me just give a little bit of a disclaimer. Today will be a sermon light Sunday. No, it won't. Today, we have so much to cover. And I don't want this to feel like a classroom. You know, like that's not what Sundays are about. I know about classrooms. I've been in them. Today is about saying thank you to Jesus as we sing to him, as we pray, as we fellowship, as we learn his word, it should motivate our hearts towards worship this week, where in our attitudes, actions, and choices, and decisions, and engagements, and friends, and goals, and habits, and interests, and the jokes we laugh at, we're motivated to love God. I hope that's what happens at this time in God's word. But here's what I would say. You see, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 through 45, are these conflicts that will happen during the great tribulation period. Anyone ever been through that? Okay, so that's a little bit in the future. Can we agree to that? Does anyone here know everything about the future? Okay, me either. Me either. I don't know. I read the Bible and have faith just like you. We're going to pick up in verse 36 and read all the way through chapter 12. Verse 13, but in, in, in chapter 11, verse 36 through 12, 3, here's what you see. And we're covering more than this, but let me just share a little bit of what you'll see today. The rise of the Antichrist, the tribulation, 
war and invasions, the battle of Armageddon, the return of Christ to defeat Antichrist, the resurrection of the dead, and the glorious kingdom. And we got 29 minutes. And that's half of what we're covering. So you say, good Lord, how do we do this? Well, Pastor Joe once shared with me this truth that a problem well stated is half solved. Meaning if you can write things down, it's very helpful. Aren't you glad God did that? So what I did this week was I wrote some things down and we printed them and we put them at the connect desk and they put them online. And we would call these teaching notes. Why? Well, I need them. I don't know all this stuff. I need some help. But also, we won't cover everything that's in this uh, paper in front of you. It's not possible. But I want you to have the opportunity, if so inclined, to at least have the ability to continue your learning journey. So as we travel through the text today, I have a pretty specific goal. And here it is. I'm going to share my goal, then we're going to pray, then we're going to get into the scriptures. Here it is. I hope that you fall deeper in love with Jesus and that you know that you can trust him. That when you leave this room today, through one of these six exits, you would say, God, I can trust you with our government. I can trust you with Highway 98. I can trust you with that relationship or that investment or that lack of funding, or Lord, just the lack of clarity that I'm living in, in the season that I'm in. I don't know what I'm doing. Wherever you are today, here's my hope, here's my prayer, that as you listen and learn, you would see how to love and live and lead just like Jesus, better and more than when you first came in here today. Now, if you don't yet know Jesus, I think you're called to repentance and faith. And if you do know Jesus, I think we're called to repentance and faith. The first, for justification and salvation. The second, for a greater degree of sanctification and surrender. See, we're all in the same boat here. We all in this room need more of Jesus. How many of you would agree with that? That's more than said that needed self-control. Well, at least you all know you need Jesus. That's good. It's a good place to start. We're on the same page here. Well, Father, I pray as we open your word that you'd give me the ability to serve your people well. Spirit, would you speak through the word of God in a way that's meaningful and impactful and helpful? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Daniel 11, verse 36. I'll read from a thought-for-thought -thought translation called the New Living. Here's verse 36. The king will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater, greater than every god even blaspheming the God of gods, he will succeed. But only until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined will surely take place. He will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors or for the God loved by women or for any other God. For he will boast that he is greater than them all. Verse 38. Instead of these, he will worship the God of fortress, a God his ancestors never knew, and lavish on him gold, silver, precious stones, and expensive gifts. Claiming this foreign God's help, he will attack the strongest fortresses. He will honor those who submit to him, appointing them to positions of authority and dividing the land among them as their reward. Now, as aforementioned, this is a time yet to come, known as the great, does anyone know it rhymes with mibulation? Tribulation. The Old Testament, the New Testament speak of a great time of judgment and wrath that is coming for the world. Tribulation. And it is yet to come. What does that mean? It means everything that you have seen that has been horrific to this date and time is nothing in comparison to that which is coming. My fifth grade graduated daughter learned so much about the Holocaust this year in school. And I've had the opportunity to visit the Museum of the Holocaust a couple times in Israel. 
And she's learning all these things and asking, Dad, did you know this? Dad, did you know that? Can you believe people could do this and that and this and that? And I said, oh, Layla, it's very sad, but it pales in comparison to what's coming. You see, Daniel 9, the chapter preceding chapter 10, speaks of 70 sets of sevens prophetically for the nation of Israel. Many believe that 69 of these sets have already taken place. That's what Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 through 35 is about. The last seven begins when Israel steps into some form of covenant protection with a powerful world leader. You can reference Daniel 7 about that. You see, and in verse 36 through 39 of chapter 11, where we are, we see the rise of the Antichrist. And here's how he does not show up. He doesn't show up like this right here. Like, hi, I'm here. If you know who this is, you watch reels on Instagram. But if you don't, you don't need to know. But if you do, you know who that is. It's not like he, he shows up like this. Hey, you are now one of my elite employees. That's who you people are. That's not who the anti, that's not how he shows up. He, he, he rises to power part of a ten-nation coalition known as the Little Horn in chapter 7 of the book of Daniel. He begins as a man of peace. How many of you would say, man, I sure would love to see our world have some peace? Uh, who wouldn't want that? It's always the sugar-coated poison apple that gets you. Nobody likes sugar. Everyone, everyone likes sugar. Everyone wants peace. He will bring a resolution to conflict in the Middle East. He will be a master politician. And here in Daniel 11, Gabriel describes him as kind of a selfish, spellbinding orator that exalts himself. Kind of like this guy. Have, you, have your kids seen this 18 times like my kids have seen this? You know who this is? You got grandkids? Are you awake? Like, this is what's happening in, in culture around you. This movie is taking people by storm. It's the prequel to Snow White. But anyway, this is how he shows up. Magnifico. He's not a guy that you would suspect. It's not some guy that you're like, well, we can take Magnifico down, but um, it's not a guy that you would like, oh, there he is, the Antichrist. We, we, point, we found him. No, you ain't going to see him coming. The enemy has existed before you did. Have you read Revelation 12? Have you read Genesis 3? Here are his tactics. Deception. Lie. Accusation. Division. Angel against angel and then angel against God. Revelation 12. Human against human, then human against God. Genesis chapter 3. Man versus wife. Leader versus those who are being led. Deception, lie. Accusation, division. This is a well-worn tactic of the enemy of your soul. And he studies you. He knows your tells, knows your weak points. And I'm just going to share this with you. He's coming for you. He's coming for you. Where do you spend your time training? Are, are you ready? Do you discern? Oh, this is lust of the flesh. This is pride of life. This is the world system. I don't need to know that. That's not for me. Are you training or being entertained? Where is your focus in life? Give them circus and give them bread, Caesar said. That's how you control the mob. So what do we do today? Give them some streaming. Give them some calories. That'll keep them sedated. Entertain them. Don't let them train. You see, Gabriel uses a phrase that's very interesting, that he rejects the God of his ancestors. What does that mean? It does indeed refer to the God of Israel, but it could also be translated the gods of his ancestors, meaning this man may be a nun. You say, what do you mean? He wears black and white? He's Sister Act? Whoopi Goldberg? Is that what you're talking about? Now, you know what a nun is, right? Hey, what's your religious affiliation? None. That's pretty trendy right now. 
I don't know if you know that. That's most of American youth. None. I want nothing to do with that. That's this guy. He's a secularist. One who just believes what's right in front of him. Pragmatic. But Gabriel also says he will have no respect for the God loved by women. Does that mean this guy? Like he doesn't watch Marvel? Like, oh, I don't like that guy. Well, that's the God loved by women, right? No, and we don't have to put him up there anymore. We can take Thor down. But like, what does this mean? That he's not, he has no respect for the God loved by women. What does that mean? Some say, well, maybe he's homosexual. Maybe, maybe not. The phrase may relate to Haggai chapter 2, verse 7, a title for the Messiah. It was the desire of Jewish women to give birth to the promised Messiah. So not only will Antichrist reject all religion in general, but he will oppose the Jewish, Jewish religion in particular, especially the hope of a Messiah to return and deliver them from their enemies. That's what that means. That he's not just a secularist, but he's out to get those who would in any way indicate that a Messiah is yet to come. Sounds like a great guy to have dinner with, right? He is the God of might and military power. That's who this is. And when the people of the world worship him, they will actually be worshiping Satan. Does anyone know Zechariah? It's not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Concerning is the day when Christians, by might and power, try and win the way forward. It's not the way forward. It's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. Now, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, we'll begin to gain a little bit of insight into the time of tribulation. There's more information there that you can read at a later time. But let's pick up our study in verse 40 of Daniel chapter 11. Verse 40, where we left off reading. It says, Then at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack the king of the north, and the king of the north will storm out with chariots and charioteers and a, a vast navy. He will invade the lands and sweep them through like a flood. He will enter the glorious land of Israel, and many nations will fall. But Moab, Edom, and the best part of Amnon will escape. He will conquer many countries, and even Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over the gold, the silver, the treasures of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians will be his servants. Verse 44. But then news from the east and the north will alarm him. He will set out in great anger to destroy and obliterate many. He will stop between the glorious holy mountain and the sea and will pitch his royal tents. But while he is there, his time will suddenly run out and no one will help him. Chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the archangel who stands guard over your nation, will arise then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. Aren't you glad you came to church on Sunday? Isn't this wonderful? But at the time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book of life will be rescued. This is intense. This is powerful. I mean, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 through 43, we you get some insight into some militaristic invasion that will happen. Antichrist moves into the land of Israel. Sets himself up, declares himself to be a ruler. Daniel says that there will be those in the north and south that will oppose. Antichrist will overcome. He'll acquire great, great wealth as a result. Anyone remember this movie from the late 90s? You remember this one? It's not very well titled. Because that's not technically what Armageddon's all about right there. But in Daniel 11, verse 44 through 45, we see a non-Bruce Willis version of Armageddon. Does that make sense? You see, throughout the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period, nations will submit to the rule of Antichrist. There will be growing opposition, and it'll culminate in a battle. I don't know, have any of you guys ever seen the Valley of Megiddo? You ever been there? I've been there a couple times. It's an interesting place when you go to Israel because history is layered upon itself. 
So as you're overlooking the valley of Megiddo, you know who's standing there in a statue? Does anyone remember? Elijah. Mount Carmel, where the prophets of Baal were slain. He's like victoriously looking over Megiddo. It's a pretty interesting picture. But here's the interesting thing that we see. Matthew chapter 24 tells us the sign of the returning Son of Man will appear in the heavens and opposing armies will unite to fight against him. But the Lord will descend from heaven with his armies and defeat them. If you're like, where is this guy? How do I learn about this? Again, make some friends today. You're like, I am confused. There's Scott Shepherd; he can tell you all about this. I mean, there's other people in the room that can, hey, let's do a Bible study together. But what I'm trying to do in this morning is give you an overview of what Daniel sees. He, he sees this dynamic where it's this like return of Christ in verse 45. The Lord descending from heaven with his armies. And if you read Revelation 19 and Zechariah 12, you see that he takes captive Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet that is to come, and he throws them in the lake of fire. Now, there is so much more to cover in this text. So much more. It's interesting, Daniel doesn't reveal this truth, but if you've read of the prophet Zechariah, he promises that the nation of Israel will see Messiah as he comes, recognize him and repent of their sins and trust in him. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 through 13, chapter 1. And Jesus will stand on the Mount of Olives and he'll be king over the earth, as it says in Zechariah 14, Revelation 20. And now in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 12, we see a description of the kingdom that is to come. If you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus is Lord. Jesus. Now, since you've confessed that, if you believe that in your heart, welcome to the kingdom of God. You just got saved. Okay, verse 2. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise, listen to verse 3. Pay attention, don't miss this. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. That is the kind of star I want. Not the ones in Hollywood that you walk on and spit on and just kind of, those stars, okay. Those are the stars. Those that lead many to righteousness. You qualify for that. You can lead your sphere of influence towards righteousness today. When you hear gossip, you can go, nope, I'm, I'm going to be a star here. I'm cutting it out. When you hear dissension, nope, I know that's a tactic of the enemy. Remember, we learned that on Sunday. Revelation 12, Genesis 3, lie, accusation, deception, division. I'm cutting that stuff out. I'm going to encourage the people around me towards right living. That's the superstar. You see, in verse 2, we see a clear description of what I would call resurrection. Please listen to this. Don't miss this. Resurrection is not reconstruction. God doesn't necessarily put back together the body that has turned into dust, for the dust that has become a part of other bodies of people will be eaten food and grown in soil. The resurrection body is a new and a glorious body. The relationship between the body that's buried and the body that's raised is like a seed to a mature plant. Does that make sense? Like you never put a, like an apple seed into a ground or a watermelon seed. I remember when we were kids, we lived off Salon Drive. Does anyone know where Salon Drive is, Tiger Point? One time they were like, oh, we ate watermelons on the trampoline. We went out of town for a while, came back and underneath the trampoline, do you know what was there? Watermelons. And they were way better than the seeds. Way tastier. They were bigger. They actually tasted good. The seeds were okay. But the watermelon? Does that make sense? Am I, am I making sense? That's what the resurrected body is like. There's continuity. Hmm. Oh, there's so much here that I want to share, but I also want to respect your time. I would encourage you 
to grab the notes and to read the remainder of page four. If you kind of wonder what's coming for us, they call that the study of eschatology, the study of things to come. And here's a great way to create a dynamic conversation over tacos on Tuesday. Say, hey, what's your eschatology? That's a great way to start a fight. That's what I found. Um, there's a lot of people that have a lot of different opinions. I share mine in this paper. You can read them. I believe them wholeheartedly. But I also got to say this. I see through a glass dimly, just like you do. But I do believe that the dead in Christ will be raised, that living believers will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air, and he will bring his people with him to share in victory and glory. And those who died without faith in Christ will not be raised till the kingdom age and then be judged. And Daniel says, some will awaken to enjoy the glorious life with God and others to everlasting judgment. So what's the point of all this? Let me put this up on the screen. If you have been born only once, you can die twice. But if you have been born twice, born again through faith in Christ, you can die only once. Does that make sense? I'd like to be born twice, not die twice. See, Daniel not only talks about resurrection, but reward. Here's the interesting thing. How we have lived has impact. Let's put it in Maximus Aurelius, whatever the dude's name is from Gladiator. What we do in life, you know that word? Echoes in, oh, you guys don't watch movies. What we do in life echoes in eternity. There's a bit of truth in there. That what you do with your money matters. What you do with your time matters. Does it matter for salvation? No. Do you see three crosses in this room? That's what gets us into heaven. Not about what you know. Not about what you've done. But about who you know. You get up there and you go, hey, poof, I don't deserve to come in. But I know this guy. He says I can come in. I have learned in life it is more about who you know than what you know, even on the other side of life. Jesus says I can come in. He's my friend. He's my savior. He's the one that says I get in. And there will be reward for those who faithfully follow him. I think that this is a lie that many of Christians in America don't embrace. You're saved. So go make money. Get that fourth house. Take a break. Relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. For when you die, you're going to heaven. All true. All true. But I will never forget an 80-year-old friend who was near their deathbed. And I was sharing with this person about the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. And this individual said, I have never heard of this before. And I thought, I'm so sorry that you lived your life without perception and clarity of where the boundaries were, what it, what it took to get a W, not for salvation, but for what you read here. You see, faithfulness to God today will lead to reward and responsibility in the future kingdom. Read Matthew 13, 19, 25, Luke 19, Revelation 2, and Revelation 5. The best day to start serving the Lord was yesterday. But today works too. Does that make sense? That was the best day to do it. As soon as humanly possible. Start reorienting your life around the kingdom of God. That's the, the best day to do that was yesterday. But it's okay. You're here today. So let's do it today. Does that make sense? Because whether you understand it or not, you are living for a kingdom. You truly are. It may be yours. Well, I got to get all my situation together. My stuff, my salary, my sport. I got to get all that aligned. And once that gets aligned, I'll start serving the kingdom. 
You know what I've learned about, uh, we'll use the analogy of stickers. Anyone know people that put stickers on their cars? You ever met people like that? I know some people like that. I found that when you put one on, you're like, huh, well, another one would look good right here. And then maybe another one right here. And then right here, right here. I've heard that same thing about tattoos. I personally don't have a tattoo, but I know people that do. And I've learned that some people that get one go, huh, maybe another one. This is my point. If you make your goal a good thing and not a God thing, a good thing robs, is robbed of the good thing that God intended it for. It's okay to have stickers on your car. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But if I live for stickers, don't you think that's a little silly? Stickers are like salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, and sport. You live for those things. They're just stickers, man. You're going to have to keep getting more stickers. You're trying to fill a Grand Canyon hole with gravel. And you'll just never get there. So enjoy the stickers to the glory of God. But live for the kingdom of God. Reward and responsibility in the future kingdom are something to be desired. Now, let's wrap this up. Let's look at verse 4 of chapter 11. I'll read all the way through to the end of chapter 12. Verse 4 of chapter 12. I'm sorry. We're not going back to chapter 11. Some of you guys, I saw you get like, I saw like, oh my goodness. Like, no, no, no. Verse 4 of chapter 12. My apologies. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal it up, the book, until the time of the end when many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. Well... Then I, Daniel, looked and saw two others standing on opposite banks of the river. One of them asked the man dressed in linen, who was now standing above the river, how long it will be until these shocking events are over. Verse 7, the man dressed in linen who was standing above the river raised both his hands toward heaven, took a solemn oath by the one who lives forever. Meaning this is an important thing. He's not like, I don't know, it'll all just pan out. No, this is what he says. It's pretty intense. How long is this going to happen? It will go on for a time, times, and half a time. When the shattering of the holy people has finally come to an end, all these things will have happened. Verse 8, I heard what he said, but I did not understand what it meant. So I asked, how will this finally end, my Lord? Like basically saying, hey, you didn't get my question. But he said, go now, Daniel. For what I have said is kept secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined by these trials. But the wicked will continue in their wickedness, and none of them will understand. Only those who are wise will know what it means. From the time the daily sacrifice is stopped and the sacrilegious object that causes desecration is set up to be worshipped, there will be 1,290 days. And blessed are those who wait and remain until the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of days, you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. Now, there is a lot said there. There's a mention of a book in verse 4. You see, in the ancient world, official transactions were ratified by two documents, one that was sealed and kept safe in a place and one that was kept available. It's like God looked upon Daniel's book as the deed that guaranteed that he would faithfully keep his promises to the people of Israel. To close up the book and seal it didn't mean to hide it away as much as it was because it was God's message given to his people so that they would know the future. The book was to be treasured. That's what that means. Protected, shared with the Jewish people. However, the book was to be sealed in this sense, that the full meaning of what Daniel wrote would not be understood until the time of the end. Daniel did not fully understand all that he saw, heard, or wrote. Anyone else feel like that today? You're in good company. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are helpful to one another. 
There's another phrase here that's worthy of note, verse 4, when many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. I don't know that it's as much a reference to planes, trains, and automobiles and the internet as much as it is that in reference to the study of God's word in the last days, especially the study of prophecy. Kind of creepy cool, but you're fulfilling that right now. Meaning that there will be this dynamic that people will be more informed of what God is doing. Did you know that you live in a generation that's had more access to God's word and the understanding of it than any other generation? If you want to go hang out with David Guzik this afternoon, just get online. You can get to know everything that guy says. It's not for lack of access. Often it's for lack of interest due to distraction. Now in verse 5 and 7, two more angels arrive on the scene, one on each side of the Tigris River. The man clothed in linen refers to the awesome per person Daniel saw at the beginning. And when one of the angels asked, how long will it be till the end? The Lord replied, for a time, time and half, meaning three and a half years. And here's the thing. The key to God's timing and timetable, did you catch this here, is a reference to his holy people. The Jewish people. Isn't that a loaded thing to say on the first Sunday of June in 2024? You see, throughout the book of Daniel, the emphasis is on the nation of Israel. And the only reason other nations are mentioned is in their relationship to that nation. While the tribulation period is a time for punishing Gentile nations, read chapter 3 of the book of Joel. It's also a time for sifting and purging Israel and preparing the Jews for the return of their Messiah. Now, as we close, verses 8 through 13, you see a description of the end. Daniel humbly asked God for wisdom. The interesting thing about us and God is we're on a need-to-know basis. Have you ever found that out with God? But we can trust him. He's given us enough to know. And as we close, let me, let me read from a great author that often puts complex things into simple forms. Warren Wearsby says this, The significance of the days here isn't clear, but there is a blessing attached to the second number. The starting point is the middle of the tribulation, when the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple. Since there are those many days before the tribulation ends, the 1,200 plus days would take us about 30 days beyond the return of the Lord. And he mentions the 1335 and 75 beyond the end of the tribulation. Say, so what does that mean? Although God taught Daniel many things and revealed to him many mysteries, he didn't reveal everything to him. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. It was not for him to know everything before he died. He needed to know that even though there was chaos, chaos, God was still in control. You know, earlier this year, I had the opportunity to be in the country of Turkey. And while there, we went to this place where they make Persian rugs, like legitimate Persian rugs. Very expensive. I bought nine of them. No, I didn't. I, didn't, <laughs> I couldn't even afford a little mouse pad. They were so expensive. Um, but it was interesting to watch these individuals make these rugs. And while there, there were also these things like on the wall, there were rugs, but there were also these things like tapestries where the back of them were like knotted. Does that make sense? But the front of them were not knotted. The front of them were like beautiful works of art. And the back of them kind of looked like a Northwest Florida yard full of weeds. They were everywhere. And they didn't make any sense. They looked chaotic. But when you flipped it over, oh, that's what that is. I'm of the opinion that only God sees the right side of the tapestry. Does that make sense? He gives us enough information to trust him. Can you imagine where you would be as a Christian if you didn't have Bible and you read the headlines of May 2024? You'd be like, what in the world? I got I got This is worthy of freaking out. And I would agree with you. Yeah, we should freak out. Who knows what's going on? It's crazy out there. But then I read Bible and I go, oh, wait a second. 
It seems like God's in control. So if God's in control, I can stay self-controlled because I know God. You know who God is? God is in control. So here's the deal. How does this apply to us? There is so much to learn from God's word. You will never exhaust that journey to be a lifelong learner of the living word of God. This book radically sets into perspective that even with the chaos around us, there's a plan and we can trust God. I mean, do you remember some of the other accounts in the book of Daniel? When Daniel and his friends were first in captivity and they're supposed to eat the meat and all the things, the delicacies, and what do they say? We want fruits and veggies. God blessed. They followed the plan. Hey, God told us to do this. That's what we're doing. God blessed them. You remember Daniel interpreting the madman Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel and his friends trusting God through the fire. Daniel trusting God through turnover and turmoil in multiple administrations. Daniel trusting God through gossip and backbiting. Daniel trusting God in the lion's den. See, in this book, we see the blessing of trusting God. We see the blessing of prayer. Remember, he's praying for three minutes before he gets out an amen and bam, Daniel chapter 10, there's an angel. We see the power of prayer, the power of faith, the power of the word of God. Daniel chapter 11 and 12 demand your attention. When someone says the Bible, ah, okay, let's read Daniel 11 and 12 and look at some of the historicity of this stuff. Why don't we go to the Grand Canyon together and check that place out? Those who say it's full of inconsistencies and challenges, please let me share this with as much respect as I can. They are lazy. They're lazy. I can say that because I was in their classrooms. At age 18, I was in the first private college, university, I guess you call it, in the state of Florida as a pre-law major. I was there the year it secularized. And so much of the curriculum carried over from a Christian perspective. But the Christian curriculum, its intention was to put the bifurcation of Jesus of faith and Jesus of history. And their intention was to shape every freshman to see the difference between the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history. And when my profs found out that I was a pastor's kid, I was target number one. And I learned these guys have an agenda. These guys who, are right, who, are, who have my textbook, they're the authors of it. They're quoting from the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society. If you don't know what that is, you should figure that out because that's often used as a translation to explain how the Tanakh is different than your Protestant Bible. You know why that is? Because they include the commentaries, the commentaries of rabbis as scripture. No wonder it's so messed up. You ever been in a sermon and go, that's messed up. You might be doing that today. That's messed up. Like, infallible human sources should not be placed on the same level of scripture. So this is the deal. This is what I would say. After 23 years of trying to learn, you can trust this. You can trust this. Go dig in the dirt. Look at how it works together both coherently and correspondently to reality as it actually exists. This beats everything every single time. It would do well for you. Don't you wish there was a church? That every single, it would do well for you to get to know this book. The better you know this, the better you'll know how to do this. Relationally, financially, organizationally, emotionally. The better you know God's word and the principles therein. And here I'm just going to say this in all humility. And I, I understand how this may be perceived by some, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's Ephesians chapter 5. God gives gifts to the church. Do you know what that gift is? Ephesians 5 references leadership. Pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, 
apostles, he calls it, in Ephesians 5. And I am of the opinion that you should hold your spiritual leaders in respect and also at the same time that they're just a person. Does that make sense? Here's what I've witnessed over time. With most spiritual leaders, we either deify them or demonize them. And we forget that they're just a dude. Does that make sense? Oh, that person's great. They must walk on water. Have you eaten spaghetti with them? Do you see how sloppy it is? Like, they're just normal. But there's a gift there. Yes, the person is a gift. Don't disrespect the gift, but don't deify them and don't demonize them. Just recognize they're just like you. And I have had the opportunity in my life to have a lot of mentors, a lot of mentors. One of them is my father, but I have a lot of others. And I didn't manipulate the situation for them to come in my life. God just worked it out. And here's what I've learned with all the men that I've known. Huh. They're heroes and they're zeros. Does that make sense? They are. They're heroes. Man, that's awesome. And that's a bummer. And that's awesome. And that could be better. Like, and isn't that you? Isn't that me? Isn't that all of us? But here's the point. When the church gathers with qualified leadership under the authority of God's word, living out the values that are in God's word and the missional mandates that are given in God's word with the singular vision that God has to see new life through his son, then the church could be an unstoppable force. Because the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. What does that mean? It means the church is not on the defense. Gates are a defensive element. It means the church wakes up and goes, wait a second. We're going on the offense. We're going to partner with people like Jonathan Domingo. We're not going to allow that kind of stuff to happen in Central and South America. That's crazy. We should have a few good people step up and help. And the gates of hell will not prevail against that. I've, I've met some bullies in my life. Have you ever met a bully? Often there's more bark than bite. And when you just push the bully, they go, whoa. Like Scud Farkas, you know who that is? Like maybe you don't know who that is. Christmas story. You just face them. You face your fears. And then you move forward. Can you imagine what your sphere of influence would look like if you actually believed the gospel? had the power to heal a marriage, the power to change the lives around you, you would be a force to be reckoned with by the spiritual forces of darkness. And also, you would start to experience attack because you're moving forward. And when you move forward, expect to get hit and to keep getting hit from within and from without. But I don't know any other way to live. Everything else is boring. It doesn't satisfy. Yeah, there's gratification, I guess. But I don't want to live to be gratified. I want to be satisfied. And for me, that's following Jesus, wherever that takes me. And whatever that costs. That's what that means. Because I know what it's like to be lost. I don't ever want to go there again. Ever. So whatever that takes to see what he wants done, that's what we do. Because that's the only place I'm safe. It's the only place you're safe is following that still small voice of God's spirit, confirmed and corrected by God's word, and letting your life be a sacrifice, not a show, and staying self-controlled, because God, whom I have gotten to know, is in control. So I can trust him. I can trust him. You can trust him. We can trust him. Because in a world of chaos, God is in control. So I can stay self-controlled because I know that God, through his word and through his character, is in control.